All right, everybody, we are back. Roger says hey. Some of you might have been expecting me to put out a video on Russia next. However, I realized that I accidentally skipped over a Patreon request <laughs> way back, and I wanted to go back and do this one. We will be getting back to the Russia stuff probably in the next video or two, but I do want to mix it up a little bit. This Patreon request was from Ahmad Akasha. I'm not quite sure how to say that name. I hope that's right. But he said that uh, given that you've done quite a number of Napoleon videos previously, I would like to recommend this video on Napoleon's greatest foe, at least according to YouTuber Lindy Bage. While it's on the long side, is done in a narrative storytelling manner, making it rather lighthearted watch. This channel, Lindy Bage, is one that has been recommended to me by a lot of different people. Um, not necessarily this video, but just the channel in general. I watched one of his other videos just by random accident on YouTube, and it was about the school that he went to, actually. Uh, I guess about British public schools. He had like a good sense of humor and stuff, so uh, that's the only video of him I've watched. Um, this one's probably gonna be a little different since it is more of a historical video. It is long, it's about an hour long, which is why I'm gonna be putting this into two parts and split it up. So we'll be doing part one today and then I will, uh, in part two, we'll do comment time and you guys can answer questions. If I have any, I don't really know. Um, I've never really watched a video like this before. I looked at the description of, of this video and it doesn't look like he lets me know who the foe is. I think a lot of people's first guess would be that Napoleon's greatest foe is uh, Wellington on the British side of things, but I don't think it is. I, I don't know why. I think it's not Wellington though. I guess we'll find out in this video, so let's go ahead and take a look. Of all the people who did the world good by combating Napoleon Bonaparte and thwarting his ambitions, who do you think did the most good? Well, you could say, well, it, it's got to be surely the Iron Duke, Duke of Wellington, right? Because he defeated them at Waterloo. Well, Maybe not. Oh, some of you might say, oh no, it'll be a Russian general who threw him back from Moscow and you know the retreat from Moscow and the destruction of the, the, the Grand Army. Is it, is, is it that? Mm, possibly not. Oh, you might think, ah, of course, it's Nelson, isn't he? Because if Nelson hadn't smashed uh, Napoleon's uh, combined Spanish and French fleets at Trafalgar, and then uh, Napoleon would have had so many more options around the Mediterranean and around the rest of the world. Well, yes, it's, it's Nelson, of course. You know, the column in, in London and everything. Well, all of those people are candidates, but in the opinion of Napoleon himself, it was someone that you perhaps haven't even heard of. Sidney Smith, later Sir Sidney Smith. All right, he was born William Smith, but never mind. He, he used his middle name, Sidney Smith. Have and I, heard I believe this man uh, deserves more recognition, and so I'm making this video, which has been sponsored by Audible. More of them later. Now, I won't go into all the details of his birth, they were quite mundane. Essentially, he joined the Navy quite early and got a lot of experience early on fighting in the uh, American Revolutionary War, also known as the War of Independence. And he distinguished himself in action with his conspicuous bravery such that he came to the attention of his commanders who promoted him to lieutenant. And that was quite remarkable because naval regulations stipulated that you had to be at least 19 to be a lieutenant, whereas he was 16. Yeah very young, and within a couple of years of that, Jeez. he had the command of his own ship. So he was rising up the ranks, it seems through merit, though he was reasonably well connected, it seems largely through merit, very, very quickly. Uh, but okay, then, so but, well, you know, peace. I, I know people had shorter lifespans, lifespans back then, and uh, 16 was considered a little bit more grown up than it is now, but seriously, <laughs> like, how much can you trust a 16 year old to command a ship? And I would imagine that a lot of the people on the ship are older than him too, which would be kind of weird, be taking orders from a 16 year old. Maybe if he has even less like experience from you or from, um, than you, I don't know. It just seems odd to me that you give 16 year old that much responsibility. Although I you know, was learning that all of Russia's um, rulers, czars, whatever, we're also like 16, so, you know, I mean, that's a lot of responsibility, too. Peace broke out, and there was nothing for a young naval officer to do at that moment, and he was, he was uh, put on half pay and given some time off. So he went travelling, and already he was thinking about getting into diplomacy and intelligence. And he, he travelled quite widely to places like uh, Spain, and he ended up in, um, in Turkey, in Istanbul. Um, not Constantinople, it's now Istanbul, not Constantinople. Why did Constantinople get the works? Well, that's nobody's business but the Turks. Um, his brother worked for the embassy in 
uh, Istanbul and so that was one connection and so he was building up connections within that world of diplomacy and and foreign affairs and making connections in places significantly like Turkey um, now uh, one of the things he did was in 1790 get employed by King Gustav III of Sweden who needed a naval advisor and he appointed him despite that he was only 26 years old at the time he appointed him as chief uh, naval advisor uh, to the Swedish and gave him command of a squadron quite a large and significant squadron of the Swedish Navy and he fought at the Battle of Svenskund and won a staggering victory against the Russians who were the enemy at that time and uh, the Russians lost 64 Still ships uh, to the Swedish <laughs> four ships and so pleased was King Gustav that he knighted Sydney and the Sydney became Sir Sidney Smith um, although he was, of course, not a British knight at this point, he was a Swedish knight, and many of his fellow officers uh, teased him for many years after that as the Swedish knight. Now, one unfortunate knack that Sidney had was making enemies, but it seems that he made enemies not of people who actually met him and knew him, but of people who didn't. People high up and elsewhere did not like him for lots of reasons. He had too much initiative and acted, you know, without... well consulting them and, and they wanted to be feel they wanted to feel that they were in control not this this guy who's there in the field with lots of initiative doing stuff even if it's good we are supposed to order, order these things drat it um, he also gained the enmity of a lot of British officers in the Royal Navy for that victory uh, at Svenskund because a lot of British officers had been serving with the Russian Navy and got killed in that battle uh, well I suppose that's the risk you take with foreign adventures anyway um, he was in Constantinople when war broke out with the French, yes, again. Uh, now, <laughs> in post-revolutionary France, there were an awful lot of people who really didn't like this revolutionary France thing at all. And though they might not have been the greatest fan of all the various Louis that had, had, had been king uh, for so long into the past, um, they preferred it to the reign of terror uh, which was taking place in France at the time under people like Robespierre. So, there were loads of revolts against the revolution and these people were often referred to as royalists even if they weren't strictly speaking royalists and several cities including Toulon rebelled against the reign of terror so um, he heard oh there's a war on great uh, I'm, I'm a naval officer well sort of I'm not actually a serving naval officer at the moment I'm on half pay and have been been um, sort of put out to pasture for a bit but then you know what the hell I'll recruit a load of guys and get myself to Toulon we can sort out the paperwork later I want to do my bit so he arrived there and made himself available to uh, Lord Admiral Hood or Admiral Lord Hood who was uh, commanding the defense of the city with an international force including uh, quite a few um, uh, uh, Spanish but of course also lots and lots of French I can see where this is going already so Toulon was I think the first battle that um, Epic History TV did on the Napoleonic Wars, I remember. And I do remember how the British were very were a very formidable defense of that city, basically, and gave Napoleon all kinds of problems. And I'm guessing that Smith here it was a key factor in that. And that may be where this all started. I'm I, Given the length of this video, I'm sure that uh, they must have butted heads quite a bit, maybe, but this might be the, the start of it. And they were holding out against the besieging Republican forces. Now, in command there was one colonel, uh, an artillery colonel, whose name was Napoleon Bonaparte. And this was the first time that uh, Sir Sidney and Napoleon Bonaparte actually were pitted against each other. And... From that moment on, Napoleon, who was a very superstitious man, uh, got this idea that somehow Sir Sidney was like his, his nemesis. And everything, every time he came across this guy's name, it, it seemed to fill him with a degree of foreboding. Even other people called Smith that he encountered uh, made him uh, stop <laughs> okay. and darken and sometimes go silent. Well, Sorry, this was, yeah. as I say, the first time they crossed paths. Uh, so Sidney was supposed to be have lots of support from various Spanish troops, but he didn't get that. So instead, he sallied out just himself and a few naval personnel to, you know, set fire to the French fleet a bit, which he did. And he destroyed half the French fleet by fire. And would you believe it? Later, he got criticised for not destroying all the fleet. 
which I think is a bit much, frankly. I mean, you know, if you destroy half the French fleet, that's, you know, that's a good night's work, isn't it? I would have thought so. Anyway, um, this officer doing his, his operation so much harm uh, really stuck with Napoleon in, in his mind. And uh, he wrote uh, vivid descriptions of the burning fleet and his uh, feelings at the time. So um, that was the first time the two of them, uh, the two of them crossed swords, if you like. So Napoleon found out who was that officer and he found out that was Sir Sidney Smith. This is significant because a few years later in uh, 1796, uh, so Sidney was doing something that he was uh, something of a specialist in. He was uh, doing a, uh, an inland waterway operation. He didn't actually do much fighting in the open sea. Almost all the operations that Sir Sidney got involved with were within sight of land or even in, in rivers and so forth. Anyway, he was uh, trying to capture a French ship in Le Havre uh, and it was all going very well. He'd got in there with just a few small rowing boats and uh, unfortunately luck was against him. Uh, the weather turned, the wind, the wind uh, changed direction just at the wrong moment and he ended up getting captured. Now in those days what you did when you got captured was you wrote to the commander and said uh, terribly sorry uh, you know what with you know trying to fight a war against you and everything but you know uh, you're trying to do the same to us. Um, you've got prisoners, we've got prisoners, exchange. let's just exchange prisoners. Uh, here are my details and could you please make the arrangements and this was the standard thing and it normally happened. Unfortunately, the man into whose hands the letter was put was called Napoleon Bonaparte. And he looked and he saw the name Sir Sidney Smith and thought, Oh, yes, fate has delivered this man into my hands. And he had him thrown into prison uh, in the Temple Prison in Paris. And uh, he repeatedly tried to get him tried with arson. Would you believe uh, the, his, his idea was that because he wasn't technically a serving officer at the time, that makes him a non-combatant. And so by the rules of war, maybe is that arson? Um, and anyway, nobody actually did prosecute Sir Sidney for arson. I suspect it's because they, they looked at the situation and thought, well, we'll never get this charge to stick there. You're being ridiculous, Napoleon. Who do you think you are, Emperor? Oh, ordering, ordering some around. <laughs> Honestly, Napoleon. Um, so uh, that didn't happen. But he was, that is to Sydney, in that prison for two years. And while he was in that prison, uh, he wrote a letter to Napoleon. Uh, he wrote it on the shutters to his cell. And I want to uh, read you a bit of the letter that he wrote now uh, from this book uh, called Beware of Heroes. Beware of Heroes by Peter Shankland, which is uh, one of the books that I've read about. By the way, I would not expect any prisoner to look like that. I, this is probably an inaccurate drawing to... You know, I would imagine this is a uh, sort of a fictitious drawing of what he probably looked like in prison. I don't know, uh, unless they had very cushy, like, he was allowed to keep up appearances like that, but I've never seen a prisoner in my life look like that before. Heroes. Beware of Heroes by <laughs> Peter Shankland, which is uh, one of the books that I've read about uh, Sir Sidney. Um, one has to admit that fortune's wheel makes strange revolutions, but before it can be truly called a revolution, the turn of the wheel must be complete. Today you are as high as you can be, but I do not envy you your happiness because I have a still greater happiness, and that is to be as low in fortune's wheel as I can go. So that as soon as the capricious lady who turns the wheel does so again, I shall rise for the same reason that you shall fall. I do not write this to distress you, but to bring you the same consolation that I have when you reach the point where I am. You will occupy this same prison. Why not you as well as I? I did not expect to be shut up here any more than you do now. But of course, I don't have to convince you that you will come here because to read these lines, you must be here. I assume you will have this room because the jailer here is a good man. He will give you the best room just as he did for me. Well, um... Uh, that is what he wrote then and then uh, he escaped. He escaped because he had help and he had the help of pro-royalist or anti-republican uh, friends in Paris who at some risk to, to themselves helped him escape. So he escaped and uh, joined the navy again and uh, carried on with his work. Now he do you guys know how he escapes? I mean, is it was it like a political maneuvering they did to kind of like get him out of prison, or did they actually like just like help 
him like break out like literally like a real escape uh so i i guess if it's an escape that they wouldn't have just released him because of politicals i guess i don't know unless it was like a under the table deal or something i don't know but if you guys can let me know any more about that like how he got out of prison that'd be good he was, as I say, very involved with uh, diplomacy and matters around the world. And he looked at the situation and uh, he advised the Foreign Office of his military assessment and his assessment too of Napoleon's character. He said, this Napoleon guy who's coming to power is tremendously ambitious and I predict that he's going to invade Egypt. Now, at this point, the Royal Navy didn't have bases around the Mediterranean. Uh, the Royal Navy had actually largely pulled out of the Mediterranean. So uh, that left it as, a, as a, a bit of a playground for the, the, the French fleet. And Napoleon was stupendously ambitious. He wanted to be another Alexander. He also, in his own words, wanted to make the English tremble. He saw the English as the ultimate enemy. But how could he do this? Well, he could emulate Alexander by taking an army, roughly the size of Alexander's, and replicating his feats. He could land in Egypt, conquer Egypt, and then go anti-clockwise around conquering uh, Lebanon and Palestine and so forth, up to uh, Istanbul, take out the, the, the Ottoman Turks, and then go through Vienna, conquering that, and then return to France. And then, my goodness, he would have complete control of the Eastern Mediterranean and all the trade with the, the Near East and the Middle East and the, even the trade routes to the Far East. He'd have control of the Dardanelles. He would be in such a strong position. And at the time, there was no one to stop him doing this. There were, in fact, no organized armies in a position to stop any French invasion anywhere between the Mediterranean and India. It is even possible that he was harboring some ambitions to do what Alexander did and take India as well. Because could you imagine if he'd taken India and held it, something that Alexander didn't manage to do? Well, he would have gone one up on Alexander. Uh, as I say, Napoleon was a very weirdly ambitious man. Yeah. Anyway, so Sidney was right. Um, and uh, the, uh, the British, uh, when they realised that this was a, a feasible plan, put together a task force and went to Egypt and uh, arrived with a big army and a big fleet and said right the french are coming uh we think uh, you really ought to do something about it we're here to help and they were sent packing the local uh, rulers said oh don't be ridiculous uh, these are the, the mamelukes uh, don't be ridiculous um uh, be off on your way and in fact uh, the local ruler actually forbade them from taking on supplies which is a very odd thing to do so wait the british like sent an army and navy base Task, task force. If that's the case, why would you do that without consulting them first? That seems like a big waste. One, because he didn't actually have the authority to do that. There was no war on. The British could have just bought supplies and, and that would have been just fair trade. Uh, but also, uh, Nelson and uh, his task force was in a perfectly good position to just take everything they wanted by force anyway. But, meekly they said, all right, on your own head be it. And they sailed away again. Which was perhaps a bit of a shame because the French then turned up and Yep, conquered Cairo and Alexandria. Oops. Uh, so then back came Nelson with the fleet and we have the Battle of the Nile in which Nelson pretty comprehensively beat the French and destroyed uh, half of its fleet uh, in, the, in the mouth of the Nile itself. So uh, huzzah for Nelson. Well done. Um, and Nelson was expecting great rewards, but actually he didn't get all the rewards of diplomatic um, positioning that he was expecting because this chap... Sir Sidney Smith, much to Nelson's annoyance, was, was given a role which he saw as wrong because Sir Sidney Smith was sort of uh, a diplomat and, and sort of a, uh, a soldier and, and sort of a, a Navy man at the same time because he was, he was doing this, this terra marique, this land and by sea. He was landing parties of people using his own initiative here and there. But hang on, that's army work. But hang on, no, no, stick to the Navy. And why are you doing all this diplomacy? The thing is that he knew a lot of people in the area uh, I don't actually, I haven't been able to find out what languages he spoke, but presumably, I get the strong impression that he was a bit of a linguist, so he probably uh, had some Turkish and maybe some Arabic, and uh, so he, to some degree, he was able to talk to the locals. So he had connections in the area uh, and contacts, of course, within the diplomatic service as well. Um, but this rankled with Nelson, and Nelson did not like this Sidney Smith guy, even though he didn't actually know him personally. Um, and one of the things he didn't like about Sir Sidney was that Sir Sidney was this young, 
come up through the ranks really quickly guy who kept using his own initiative rather than following the orders given him by his senior commanders. Which is a bit rich because that's exactly what Nelson did but <laughs> when he was younger. But um, now Nelson was in charge and he didn't want any you know, young Nelson types like him you know, defying him. Drat it. Anyway, um, the French, however, still had a big land army. Uh, but that land army was now stranded largely. The, the, Brit the Royal Navy was powerful enough to stop him leaving and his fleet was now half smashed in. But what he could do was carry on with his plan, which was to conquer his way anti-clockwise uh, ar around the Mediterranean. And he attacked various places that Alexander attacked, partly, I think, because Alexander attacked them and he wanted to emulate Alexander. And the slaughter was horrendous. It was extraordinarily brutal rule. And uh, when he took, for instance, Jaffa, uh, used to be called Joppa, but uh, in, by this period it was called Jaffa, uh, even after the garrison had surrendered to him and he had agreed terms, he had them all massacred. About 4,000 garrison, uh, it just taken down to the beach and had them all bayoneted. And um, he wasn't too squeamish to, to watch it being done. Napoleon was an absolutely horrendous person. It's, it's, the more you, you learn about uh, Napoleon, the more difficult it is to believe that he could have been any worse. Now, of course, there have been a lot of monsters in history, and there are people like oh, Chairman Mao and Stalin and so forth who have killed considerably more people than, than Napoleon managed to kill. Although, don't forget that in, in, in the, the mid-20th century, when Mao and Stalin were doing their stuff, there were far more people in the world to kill, and they had railways and, and aircraft and poison gas and radio and all these modern inventions which made being utterly horrendous to large numbers of people so much more efficient. Uh, I suspect that in, in terms of atrocities per capita, um, Napoleon might, might actually be top dog here. Um, he killed over two million of his own countrymen and goodness knows how many million uh, of other people around the world. So the amount of death that, that he brought to the world was quite an, an unnecessary death, was quite extraordinary. But he was also an appalling person in so many other ways, some of which I probably am likely to to mention in this. For its start, he had all these people bayoneted. And the men that he was commanding, some of them were utterly appalled. Some of his, his, uh, his officers, uh, of course, his officers were literate and they, they've left records, uh, were absolutely disgusted with the, this massacring of people who had uh, accepted a, a surrender, when, after he'd accepted their surrender. And um, some of them even became suicidal. They were so disgusted at what they'd, they'd done following his orders. Um, and it was shortly after that, actually, that plague, actual proper plague, not just some disease or other, but plague broke out in the French camp as though it was some sort of biblical retribution for the, the, the atrocity. But anyway, he went round burning and murdering and lying his way around the Mediterranean. Yeah, he was an astonishing liar. I mean, a really bad liar. I mean, a bad liar in the sense that he told absolute whoppers, but also a bad liar in that he told lies that were obviously going to be discovered. People were obviously going to see through these lies. And, and he was, at least in, in this uh, part of his career, not believed by the locals. He told uh, all the local Christians, the Coptic Christians and so forth, uh, that uh, he was there on a crusade against the Muslims and he would protect them against the Muslims. And he was telling all the Muslims that he himself, Napoleon, was a Muslim, uh, there to protect them from the nasty uh, Christians and perhaps to exterminate these, these verminous Christians. Um, and he was telling all the various different versions of... Um, uh, of the Muslims, that he was this particular type of Muslim and, and was against that sort of Muslim, or he was against this particular tribe and would protect them against the others. And God. it was an incredibly ineffective uh, piece of uh, a propaganda campaign because all Sir Sidney Smith had to do was take Napoleon's propaganda leaflets that he'd been distributing about the place and use the same leaflets because all he had to do was take the leaflets that were, that were meant to, for those people and uh, show them to those people. And I can have some of yours, find you, and show you those. Oh, and you might be interested in these ones. And everyone just saw that he was just lying to everyone and could not be trusted. But he still... Kind of reminds me of Putin these days. <laughs> these, days. these guys always seem to do that, I guess. Well, a lot of po politicians lie, though. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but... I feel like uh, Putin and his henchmen are telling the world a bunch of lies that are obvious, you know. Um, this is a side of, of Napoleon I wasn't aware of, actually. 
the Epic History TV videos I saw in him really just concentrated on the, the military aspect of the campaigns and stuff. And I don't think, I think it went into this aspect of it that he's talking about here with Egypt. I know it, it was mentioned in Epic History TV about Egypt, but uh, they didn't really cover those campaigns that I can recall. I, all I really remember of that is mostly the European campaigns that they did. Well, and um, I keep seeing references to Napoleon in Egypt, and I, I, ke I kept asking, like, why well, I don't understand. Why is he in Egypt, you know? Uh, so now I know. Thanks, Lindy Bage. Big, powerful commander in command of a big, powerful army, and therefore to be feared. So there was a definite danger that if he won, then a lot of people would join him because, you know, you've got to join the victor, haven't you? Otherwise, the victor turns on you, and this guy will definitely turn on you and kill everybody. Anyway, so Sidney took the initiative. He saw that the busying himself around in Alexandria in places like that wasn't what was needed. He put together a force and on his own initiative he went to a place called Acre. And there uh, he aided the local commander, the, 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 the local Muslim commander who was the man who at the time uh, was holding out against the French and in fact had himself taken the initiative. Uh, he had for instance put troops into, into Jaffa and, and, and other places. Um, this guy was the Pasha Jezar, who was also known as, well, it, it, it translates to Slasher. He was 60 years old and uh, was a big, ferocious man who um, showed nobody respect, apart from, interestingly, Sir Sidney Smith, um, whom he showed a lot of respect straight away. And that immediately made Sir Sidney Smith very, very respected by all the people uh, that he was dealing with in that area. So that made things a lot easier. So Slasher, Jezar, um, had uh, seen that okay, this is a guy I can do business with and he's useful. And oh, he was very useful. So Sidney Smith, um, for instance, just happened to capture all the French guns that were on, the, on their way to the siege. And uh, he then denied the use of the coast road by bombarding it from the sea uh, to the, um, the marching French army. And he then landed um, a load of troops, naval troops mainly, uh, and guns and installed them in Acre and did an awful lot to repair the defences which were in a very, very poor state. And uh, uh, for all this work uh, he was uh, given various rewards. Um, oh, uh, he, was, he was also um, given one, one award that had previously been given to one uh, Saint Richard, uh, that we know as Richard the Lionheart, yes, who of course had, uh, had, um, had taken Acre uh, when he was uh, batting around the, the Middle East, the Near East. Anyway. For saving the lives of the Greek Christians on Cyprus from vengeful Turks, he was given Richard the Lionheart's Templar Cross and made the Knights Templar Grand Prior of England. I have no idea what the Knights Templar Grand Prior of England is. Or the Templar Cross. I've heard of it before. I don't know what it is, though. And I've heard of Richard the Lionheart before as well. So... He installed himself in Acre, which was smack in the path of the advancing Napoleonic army and was commanded by the guy that Napoleon had to defeat if he could show everyone in the region that, that, that he was now in control. And uh, we are told that the hillsides filled with people watching the siege, partly out of fascination, presumably, but also because they needed to know which of these two sides was going to be the winner, which side are we going to have to side with in order to preserve our own lives. Now, the siege lasted about three months and was absolutely epic, and I cannot possibly give you all the details, but there was a huge amount of ebb and flow, an awful lot um, of times. It really looked as though the French were going to take this, this tiny, miserable little town, uh, but they kept being flung back again and again, even after they made breaches in the defences, breaches in the walls, which uh, Sir Sidney had been uh, quickly plugging up. Um, they still couldn't take the town, and... Napoleon's frustration grew and grew and grew. Uh, now, he had uh, a General Kleber, um, Jean-Baptiste Kleber, uh, under him. And um, Jean-Baptiste was quite a different man from Napoleon in, in lots of ways. Um, this is him. And isn't that hair great? Yeah, I mean, that's a proper wild hair. I hope one day when I go grey, I'll be able to, I don't think I will though. I think my hair will be too thin by then. But, you know, if I could, I would. Uh, anyway, um, this man was a problem for uh, for, uh, for Napoleon. He was competent, 
He was an ardent Republican, as in a proper Republican, an actual French Republic, not this Napoleonic version of a Republic. In other words, something a bit more like a, a monarchy. Um, and his troops were really respected him and even loved him and were getting loyal to him. So he had to keep Kleber down. And Kleber also was one of the, just about the only person, in fact, as far as I can tell, who, who dared speak up in staff meetings uh, against these stupid ideas that Napoleon kept coming up with. And he, he, um, he also dared even mock him. At one point they made a breach in the walls. He said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a spectacular breach. That is. I think a cat could get through that. Uh, or when he, shortly after he turned up, he had a look at the trenches that Napoleon had, uh, had dug. And he said, you call these trenches? Well, it's all right for you, but they only come up to my waist. Um, and I, I dare say that probably rankled with Mr. Bonaparte a little bit. Um, anyway, um, Kleber was, it seems, honourable <coughs> and straightforward. And so all right, sorry about that, guys. Scarlet saw a cat outside. Pulled with Mr. Bonaparte a little bit. Um, anyway, um, Kleber was, it seems, honourable and straightforward and someone that Sidney could do business with, but Napoleon just wasn't. And the, the pettiness, the spite, the nastiness, the utter callousness uh, of the lives of others showed itself when Napoleon was absolutely... Uh, adamant that he hadn't lost. It was a victory. Despite the fact that it was quite definitely a loss, he'd not uh, achieved his aim, had been thrown back and had lost a huge number of men and guns and so forth. In fact, he ended up losing almost all his guns. These were the guns. One of Napoleon's maxims, sorry, a bit of a sideline, uh, one of his maxims was you never abandon your guns. You can abandon your, your, your food, you can abandon your allies, you can abandon loads of things that you can abandon but you'd never abandon your guns and he was forced in the retreat to abandon guns guns that had famously crossed the alps with him had been with him for so many of his earlier campaigns he had to abandon them on in the retreat and when he went past uh jaffa on the way back the bodies that had just been left there apparently they, the stink was just indescribable anyway uh, when, he, uh, when he says guns i'm assuming he's meaning like the the cannons those type of guns um, so he's going up and down the desert, losing men to thirst and loads to wounds. Now, I was going to say he was very, uh, he was very petty and spiteful. In order to show that he hadn't lost, he had to not agree for the evacuation of the wounded. So Sidney wrote to him and, and offered uh, evacuation of the wounded, as, as, you know, as, as, a, as a good soldier would. But if... Napoleon had to do a deal with the enemy in order to uh, uh, get his wounded out, then that would mean that he must have lost. So he wasn't going to admit that. So tough to save his face. He didn't, uh, he didn't strike a deal. Now, in fact, uh, as it turned out, a lot of the wounded were evacuated and had been told a lie, one of many, a lie by Napoleon, which was that Sir Sidney um, sent home prisoners in plague ships. And it seemed that a lot of his men did actually believe this. Uh, and so when they found out that they weren't going to be sent home in a plague ship, they were almost pathetically grateful. Um, anyway, uh, another uh, petty thing he did was burn every village, destroy and burn all the crops that he came across uh, during his uh, campaign as well. Um, just uh, this scorched earth policy, just uh, the, the level of spite. But possibly the most, one of the most spiteful things he did was uh, when he finally decided, right, I'm going to give up on this siege and leave, he ordered all the remaining ammunition they had to be fired, not, not at the defences, but just into, into the civilian part of the town. It's just an act of spite. What, what military purpose did that serve? Um, if anything, all it did was turn more people even more against him. It, was, it wasn't just spiteful, it was really stupid. But there you go. This was Napoleon, one of the worst human beings ever to have disgraced the face of the earth. Okay, so he doesn't like Napoleon, <laughs> apparently. Uh, Olivo saw Napoleon asleep on his horse and shot at him and missed. The good news is that he swam away to safety. When the fire was, was muskets all misfired in the damp, but the bad news is Napoleon lived to kill another 4 million people, approximately. I feel like uh, that was recovered in one of the videos I watched. So, uh, Napoleon then uh, gave up. He thought, well, I can't now carry on with this campaign. I'm not going to make it to Istanbul. The Turks have now mobilized against me. Uh, so um, he left. He, he's, he, he got away himself back to France, slipped away um, uh, by sea and got back 
to France, leaving Kleber absolutely in the doo-doo. He left Kleber with no guns, no food, no money or any other means to pay his troops and no fleet. Napoleon took all the ships. So uh, Kleber was completely stranded. But fortunately, he was an honourable man who could do a deal with Sir Sidney. And uh, Sir Sidney um, uh, arranged a meeting at a place called, a place called El Arish and there struck a deal. And his deal was this. He would organise it such that the 18,000 troops under Kleber would be taken back to France safely by the British Navy. Um, they would own nothing uh, save the, the ground they were standing on uh, when, when they were actually in uh, Egypt, but they would be taken back to France and that's it. A piece. All right, guys, we're at the halfway point of this video. I just wanted to go ahead and stop it there. And we will pick up right there. Uh, I may go back just a little bit to kind of get back into the, the story again in part two. But yeah, really, really interesting. Yeah, I had not heard of Sidney Smith before. And I'm hearing some new stuff about Napoleon that I didn't know. Uh, I did not really realize that Napoleon had such like a mean streak in him like that, like going after civilians and just, you know, slaughtering and executing people. I mean, I know he had done some some bad things but hearing the specifics is kind of like it does kind of like make me see him in a little different light because I don't know I had kind of gotten the, the impression that a lot of a lot of people say he did a lot of really good things you know and bringing about a lot of reforms and stuff in, in Europe. I got the impression that that uh, he did a lot of bad things but maybe wasn't as bad as you know things people like Hitler or Stalin or whatever. However, after hearing some of this stuff, can you imagine what Napoleon would have done if he had had modern weapons like Hitler and Stalin had? Or, you know, more modern weapons. Anyway, it would it would be interesting. I mean, it would be horrible, but it would be interesting to see what exactly Napoleon would have done with like planes and, you know, bombs like that. And the three month siege of this uh, of acre, I think is what it was. You know, with the war going on in Ukraine right now, like I have a real world example that I can draw upon because like I know Maripol has been under siege for a month now as well as some of the other uh, smaller cities and I can I I'm seeing a siege happen in real time right now like Maripol is under siege and thinking about that going on for another two months is just it's like crazy and I know that there's probably been sieges you know that lasted longer than that I don't know in, in history but be before the war in Ukraine I didn't really have like it was just like a historical concept to me I didn't really have any sort of real world things I could draw on to you know associate that with you know but unfortunately what's going on now over in Europe it makes a lot of this stuff that I'm learning in, in history a lot more real because I'm kind of seeing it playing out in my lifetime like right now and a lot of the stuff he's talking about napoleon like characteristics of him i'm seeing you know stuff like that in in putin and when you have stuff like that going on you know in in real time before your eyes you you really do realize just how much history you know repeats itself a lot of the same sort of stuff happens over and over again just maybe in a different context but i really enjoyed that that was a really informative uh, little talk you know story about uh, Napoleon so far. I learned a lot about Napoleon that I didn't know. Uh, I learned why he went into Egypt <laughs> and just learning a little, you know, bits and pieces here and there of, you know, like warfare of that time and stuff. So it was good. Appreciate it, Ahmad, for you suggesting this. We'll have part two coming out soon. I want to give you guys a chance to watch this and um, answer questions and stuff down in the comments. And once that has happened, then we will film part two, okay? And I also want to let you guys know that if you want to follow me on social media, you'll find the links to all of that in the description of this video and the pinned comment. Also there you will see my link to Patreon and my Patreon has a bunch of videos on it that I don't do on YouTube because of copyright reasons or whatever. So, so I got a lot of content over there. If you want to go check that out, the link's down there as well in the description and pinned comment. And then you'll find my Star Trek podcast link also there. If you are a Trekkie, you might want to go check that out. Anyway, I really appreciate you guys watching this. Roger does too, and we will see you guys for part two shortly.